So, um, hey, to start us off this morning, I'm going to uh, be reading from Psalm 19, if you want to follow along. Um, if you'd like to, you can follow along on your phone, or uh, if you pull up calvaryeast.com slash today, uh, it has um, scriptures that we're looking at today and all the song lyrics and everything. You can follow along there. But let me read Psalm 19. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray together. Father, we acknowledge your greatness, your power, and your glory. And like the psalm says, it's the heavens uh, tell of it. The skies declare how powerful and great you are. Lord, we look at all of this around us, and um, we say that it has to be created. It has to be made by a powerful, mighty God who is... Uh, complex and intricate and amazing and worthy of praise and worthy of worship. And so today, Father, we come and we worship you. We come to honor you and, and we're thankful, Lord, as the psalm says, that you've given us uh, your truth, that you've revealed it, spoken through uh, the prophets of old and through your son, Jesus Christ, and and the apostles to give us truths to guide our life. Lord, give us today the wisdom to understand and to, to see how they apply to our lives today. Father, we pray, um, Lord, that those truths would penetrate into our hearts. Lord, as the psalm says, that, our, that the meditation of our heart, that the words of our mouths today would be pleasing to you. Lord, transform us from the inside through the work of your Spirit. Lord, we thank you so much that even though our sins are many, that you've provided cleansing for us in Christ, that we can be saved and that we can draw near to you. And so, Lord, we want to do that now together as we sing your praise and learn from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand again. Yes, 
heart that is broken and great are you Lord oh great are you Indescribable, uncontainable, you place 
Well, I want to express, he's not here today, but I want to express my gratitude to Chris Johnson for filling in for me last week while I was away. I had the opportunity uh, to go to um, a conference, but uh, of course, with everything going on right now, um, the turnout was so low that they canceled the speakers. I was up at the Maranatha uh, Bible Conference up in the Muskegon area. <laughs> so um, they allowed us to still come, even though they didn't have any speakers. Uh, but they uh, it gave me some time to read some some things I'd been wanting to read. This uh, I was reading this great book by a um, church history professor called "The Dynamics of Spiritual Life," and he was kind of tracking through history the different ways that that the church is times of revival in the life of the church, and um, really uh, encouraging book to me. But um, you know everything it was great. Everything went well on our trip, other than than just not the program we expected there. <laughs> and um, the weather and the travel. And of course, that's not always the case. I mean, you know, I sometimes, uh, especially it seems like if I'm in a tent, there's always uh, seems to be rain. So I kind of have that track record. Um, but and even with with travel, sometimes, you know, we've had times where the car is broken down when we've been on vacation or a flat tire uh, once coming back and things like that. And that's I think that's kind of the worst, you know, it's when you're when, when your engine's fine, your car's running, but then you just have a flat tire. Um, and, and, you know, you're stuck. Um, you have that power, but you can't move. And so I think, in a way, I think we can have a similar problem with our, our faith sometimes. I mean, when we believe in Christ, when you're saved, when you're born again... Uh, you're connected with such limitless power to transform your life. Uh, but for some reason, a lot of us are just kind of stuck. And so we have that power, but there's like a, a flatness. It's like someone let the air out of our tires sometimes. We don't move. We don't change. We don't do anything. We just, and so it seems to me like you know, that question is, how how can we avoid that? How can we how can we have a dynamic spiritual life? I mean, that was the title of the book I was reading, and and even before I got into that that book, I, I was looking at for for us to consider today the little book of Philemon in the New Testament. Um, so if you want to turn over there or follow along on your phone, we're going to look at Philemon today, and it's brief. It's it's just one chapter. Uh, it's, well, I think 25 verses, um, and it's one of the, prob it's probably the most personal of Paul's letters in the New Testament. It's right there before Hebrews, after 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus, uh, Philemon. And Philemon was a man who lived in the city of Colossae. There's some connections here when you read through Philemon and you compare it with Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, you, you see some of the same names. And uh, maybe you're familiar with the story of Philemon and, and, and the other characters that Paul mentions in this letter. Maybe not, but, but we'll, we'll see it as we read through the letter. But what we'll be identifying as we walk through is five different dynamics uh, of, of spiritual life, of, of faith, of what really should happen to, of the way that faith becomes alive and living and, uh, um, and powerful. And so just to start off, the first one that, that I think we see and as we start into the book of Philemon is the dynamic of, of love. Right? When you believe in Jesus Christ, it should produce love. Now look at that first, those first two verses, just the way Paul introduces the letter as he's writing. He says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, so this is during the time when he was had been imprisoned, probably in Rome. He says, Paul and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So, I mean, you get the sense here that 
faith in Christ should transform the way that we relate to one another. Right? Because he wasn't physically related to them, right? He, but he calls, he, he speaks of Timothy as his brother and Aphia as a sister and has this connection with Philemon and Archippus and even the church there. They met in homes, right? That's, that was what they did in the early church. They didn't have buildings. Uh, maybe they met outside like this in some cases, but most of the time they probably met in smaller groups in, in people's homes. And so there was this real sense of a family. Um, not, I mean, it's so easy for us today to think of uh, the church as, you know, more of a business, more of a service type of thing. Uh, where I where I go, you know, almost like a, like a theater, like I go to get entertained for an hour. Right? It's, it's not that. It's not a school. Right? At, at its core, it's supposed to be this sense of family. That because, of, because we believe in Jesus, because we're born again as his children, then we're brought together as a spiritual family. And so that means we should be, have that kind of family concern for one another. And that family commitment. That seems to be honestly so lacking in the way that a lot of us think about the church, right? Those kinds of connections. We need to have that. We need to have that kind of love, right? Because you remember, uh, you remember the old song, they'll know we are Christians by what? Our by our love, right? In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about love and he says, without love, I'm a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. See, it's, it's an essential expression of our faith that when we're connected to Christ, it should come out in very practical ways. And even in my own life, I mean, the practical side of this, and I think, I think it's why it was so significant in the early church, uh, as, as the gospel was spreading, you know, someone would would be saved and would believe in Christ, but the rest of their family might not be. Right? And in some cases, that might create a, a real strong division with your family. They might even shun you. There's still places, cultures in the world where that happens to believers. And so then the church is like your only family. Right? I mean, it, I know I felt some of that when I got saved. My family were not believers. I was the first one to, to come to know the Lord and and so those relationships I had with, with people at, in the church were so significant to me, right? There were people that, that really felt like brothers and sisters and, and, and my spiritual parents in, in a lot of ways. And so those connections, we should have those connections. The church needs to be that kind of body. And so just to, to start off, even write those first few verses to consider are we marked by love? Is that how we relate to one another? Is that how we relate to the church? Because um, if not, I mean, that love is what fills us up. It's like the air in our tires, right? It's the thing that, that helps us keep rolling, that helps us move forward. That love for one another. The second dynamic I think we see as we keep moving is, is prayer. Um, one, all my, all my illustrations today are tied to tires. I know that's a little strange, but it worked for me. So hopefully it works for you. My one winter, my son was driving along Sprinkle here and slid off the road and, uh, he was fine. The car was fine. It just, it, it hit one of his back tires, hit kind of the berm on the side of the road and it knocked it loose. And you know, if you, if that seal gets loose, your tires flat again. Right, another flat tire. Uh, not because of a lack of air, but just once it hits that seal, you don't have the seal, the, the tire's not stuck to the rim anymore. And I think prayer sort of has that same kind of effect in our lives. It's how we kind of stick and cling to the Lord. It's, it's what holds us to Him. It keeps us uh, going in line with His purpose and, his, uh, and it allows us to benefit from His power. And so, in most of Paul's letters, he, he talks about prayer at the beginning. Look at what he says here, uh, starting in verse 3. We're going to read down through verse 6. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So let's just walk back through that for a minute. You jump back to verse 3 and he talks about grace and and peace. I mean, those were not just greetings, right? I mean, they, they are kind of used that way. But I think it's an, it's, it's an acknowledgement that the way we change is through the grace of God. The way that we find peace and strength in life is from Him. And so that all kind of is, is rooted in, in praying. Paul is praying that for Philemon and, and Aphia and Archippus, grace to you and peace. Right? He wants God to be working in their lives. And, and the way that we can seek that is, is by praying praying Um, and then verse four he says i thank my god always when i remember you in my prayers and that you know what strikes me about that is i mean we find it hard to be thankful sometimes right but normally even our thanksgiving is thankfulness for what we're experiencing in our own lives right i mean it's a whole different level to talk about being thankful for others and thankful for what God's doing in them and through them and how God's at work in them, even if it doesn't affect us. And I think that's what Paul's talking about here, this level of thankfulness where where you're just looking for things to be thankful for, not just what I'm experiencing, but thankful for what God's doing and the lives of, of other people and around us. So, I mean, that's part of this prayer, seeking God's grace and peace, cultivating this attitude of thankfulness, right? And he, and he talks specifically about their love, that we were just going back to the first point we made, you know, the, that uh, dynamic, he sees that in them, their faith is expressed in love. And then look at verse six, and this is kind of the bridge between the, the, to the next dynamic. He says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ, right? The ultimate, that's really the ultimate goal. That's, that's the, the God's purpose at work. And the thing that we should be seeking, it's, I mean, we get so caught up praying about the physical challenges of life. And those are hard. Those are, we should pray about those things and seek God's help and his wisdom to handle and navigate those things. But the overarching thing that God is doing through all of that is, is bringing us to that full knowledge, right, of seeing who he is, what he's like, and what his, he's accomplished through salvation, and, and teaching us to rely upon that, and value it, and cling to it, and so that, in a a sense, is the ultimate thing that we should be praying for, for ourselves, and our families, and for everybody we know, is for that, uh, that growth in the knowledge of God. So we need to we need to pray that way. So are you clinging to God in prayer? Praying, being thankful. Right? It's just integrated into to life. So love, prayer, and then the third, and like I say, it's it kind of starts there in verse six, is this whole idea. He There in verse 6, Paul calls it sharing your faith, right? The idea of, of, we might say, ministry, right? Or or sharing truth. And going back to my whole tire analogy here, have you ever had like bald tires on your car where it gets really bad? I mean, we had that one winter on, on my car, and I used to drive down the hills on H Avenue over there, and it felt like I was bobsledding in my car because it would kind of, it would kind of, you know, in the, in the winter with the ice on the roads, it would kind of shift around on the road back and forth because you just don't have any traction, right? With bald tires. Well, I think ministry is where we see the traction. You know, it's that connection where the rubber meets the road sort of thing. So look at verse six again. Because he's praying for them, and he prays that the sharing of your faith may become effective. 
right? That it would lead to the full knowledge of every good thing that's in us for the sake of Christ. It all flows from him, from Christ. And then verse 7, Paul says, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So Philemon was already active. He was active in in trying to encourage people, trying to lead people to faith and and build them up in their faith. And even Paul, the Apostle Paul says he was encouraged, he was refreshed by that and others were too. This impact that Philemon was having. I mean, apparently leading the church from his own home as people would gather there with him and learn. And so that whole focus on sharing truth with one another and with people who've never heard it before, I mean, that needs to characterize our lives as a whole. That's not just something for for a pastor to do. Um, If we take a moment and we turn back to Colossians, because it is, I mean, the letter of Philemon probably was delivered right alongside uh, the, the letter to the Colossians. There's, there's some great verses that line up with this thought about sharing your faith. I mean, the first one is in Colossians 1, 28. Paul describes his ministry this way. He talks about Christ, who is the hope of glory. And then verse 28, he says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may pre- present everyone mature in Christ. I mean, that should be the driving concern for, for every believer that we want to, to grow in that kind of maturity and we want to help others grow in that kind of maturity. And the way we do that, how, he says, is by proclaiming Jesus, proclaiming Christ. Turn over to chapter 3 of Colossians, verse 16. And there's this great verse, and and again, it pulls out the idea that, it highlights the idea that it's not just the work of one person, right? That it's the work of everyone in the church. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What does that look like when the, the word, when the truth of Christ dwells in you that way? He says, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Right, those are the same words he just used back in chapter 1, verse 28, to talk about his role, teaching and admonishing. We should all be doing that. It should be part of our interaction. It should just be part of life force that we're speaking truth with one another. And then he says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual th- songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then, I mean, that all gives us the sense of that happening within the church, But then you skip down to chapter 4, verse 5 and 6 of Colossians. And Paul says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You see this driving focus that's throughout Colossians, but then, I mean, that's what Philemon was doing. And that's how Paul was praying for him. So, is that true of you? Is your faith, is it, is it gaining traction? Is it filled with love? Is it clinging to the Lord in prayer? Is it, you know, is it coming out in that sharing of truth? And that leads then to a fourth dynamic. And I think this is really where the motion begins to happen. The fourth dynamic, after love and prayer and, and the, the ministry the, of, of truth and sharing our faith, is, is the change that happens in us. I mean, we, we, all, we all live in this, this world that's uh, like this miry bog, right? It's like, a, it's like a, a mud pit in a lot of ways. It's a dirty place. And it's hard to gain traction in it. And so it has a way of sucking us in and pulling us down and, 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 and there's so much that we can get wrapped up in that's not focused on the things that God wants us to be focused on, right? And so somehow we have to escape that. And here's this amazing story 
uh, that comes out here in verses 8. I'm going to read down through verse 19. And then we'll, and then we'll kind of unpack it here. Uh, the story about, I mean, really applies to Philemon's situation. So Paul says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it to say nothing of you, your own owing me, even your own self. So what's going on here? Well, Onesimus was a bondservant. He was a slave. And apparently he was Philemon's slave. Right? Now, slavery in, in ancient Rome in that time period wasn't racially based, like we see in American history. But it, it still, it, I mean, even as you read through the Bible and you look through the Old Testament, there are provisions and rules to try to encourage uh, those who ha had slaves to treat them well, but it's not according to God's design. It doesn't honor the value of a, of a person in the way that God created someone to be. And so, you know, you try to pick out what exactly is going on here. A lot of people have thought throughout history and looking at this passage that Onesimus um, ran away from Philemon. Somehow he made his way to Rome right, and came into contact with Paul. Now, maybe he knew Paul at some point from because Paul had, had visited uh, Philemon and knew him. Maybe he thought positively of Paul. So somehow he connects with Paul in Rome. And what happens to Onesimus? Uh, Paul says there, if you look, I mean, that's, I think that's why he says formerly he was useless to you, to Philemon, right? Because he had, had run away. But he said, um, he calls Onesimus my child. And Paul says, whose father I became in my imprisonment. In other words, Onesimus heard the gospel from Paul and was saved. He was born again. He became part of the family of God. Uh, and, and Paul was excited about that. Right? And so one of the things he wants... Onesimus to do is to return and go back to Philemon. That's why this letter was written. Right now, that, because that was the right thing to do. If he was a slave legally, he should go back to his master. Um, right? Because that's what Paul is getting at when he talks about um, if he has wronged you. Right? He had run away. In a sense, he was stealing a time and money, so to speak, from Philemon. And so Paul wants to send him back and, and even be willing to cover his debt, so to speak, right? Whatever that might be. But, um, and so on one hand, you see the practical change first in Onesimus. That Onesimus as a slave is, is changed. He's born again. And now, even though he had run away, he's going to go back to his master. And even though he'd rather not do that. But then Paul turns that around and he's going to challenge Philemon. Right? And, and you see all the ways that he's doing this. He says, I'm not commanding you. I prefer to appeal to you. And he says, you know, that he wants, um, look at verse 16. He's sending Onesimus back no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. 
especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so the idea is that he wants, he's challenging Philemon to relate to Onesimus as a brother, not as a slave. Now that was, we have to see that, that was a radical thing, right? For this, you know, I assume Philemon, I mean, he had a house, he had slaves, he was probably a wealthy man. And Paul wants him now to relate to his former slave as a brother. Now it's interesting. I mean, that slavery was a part of their culture. It was part of life, right? And the the, the power and the, the wealth of Philemon, all of that. But he wants him to rise above that culture. Right? Paul didn't organize a protest against slavery. He didn't tell slaves to rebel. But here he is challenging Philemon to let his faith change the way, really to, to override the pull of culture so that he relates to Onesimus in a completely different way. Right? Ultimately, I think that probably would have been led to Onesimus being set free. Although Paul doesn't, doesn't push quite to that point. I think that's where it was headed here. And so he challenges him that way. And I think that's such a powerful example of the kind of change that should be happening in our lives as believers. That, that the gospel should cause us to rise above what we see in our culture, in our world. That we should be different, right? That how we speak, how we interact, how we relate to people should be guided by the gospel and the truth of Scripture, not by what the world around us says. So that should be, I mean, that's where you begin to see the gospel get real traction, is when our lives begin to change. And so as we keep reading, one final dynamic is, I, I'm just calling it momentum. And I think it's the idea that once change begins to happen in our lives, then it begins to take hold and begins to move forward. Because um, you get this sense of just um, all that was happening here. Verse 20, take a look. Paul says, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. See what I mean? It's leading him forward. And he says, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Remember, he was in prison. Right? So he's hoping that He'll not only be released, but he'll get to come to Colossae in person and be there with them. And he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And so there's just this sense there as he finishes off the letter of that the work of the gospel is not going to be stopped. It's going to keep going on, right? Even as he's in prison, he's confident that it's going to keep moving, that there's going to be change, that Philemon will change and grow, that God will be carrying out his work. And so we need that same kind of confidence, right? That same certainty uh, that even when the world around us seems like a dark mess, that God's at work, don't worry. Don't give in to the kind of alarmism that's so common today. Right? The Lord is at work. If he's at work in you, then he can work in others. You know, let him do that work in you. Let, let the, the gospel really take traction in your heart and begin to produce these changes that we would be filled with love and praying for one another and ministering the truth and, and then obeying in, in radical ways to be different than our culture, to be changed and transformed. Just be confident in the work of the Lord. And so I encourage you to just think practically. You know, just a short little book there. 
uh, very kind of suggestive, right? Not too on the nose, but just walking through that story and thinking about you know, how is the gospel expressed in your life? You know, are those dynamics present? I mean, if, if not, it, I mean, the, the starting point, of course, is always to go back and say, have I been born again? Have I truly trusted in Christ? Am I, am I saved? Right? Is, it a, is it a personal commitment, a personal transformation in me? That's really the starting point, to believe in that Jesus died for my sins, that he cleansed me, and that I'm going to live for him. And then to look specifically and say, you know, is, is my life marked by these sorts of things, by love, by prayer? Am I focused on that, that idea of sharing the faith with believers and unbelievers? Am I confident in the Lord and in his work? Am I, am I truly changing? Maybe there's some area of your life that specifically that needs to change, that you think, that on, on reflection, you think, I'm just following along with the world and its hatred and its lies and its, you know, everything that's a part of it. Be, be different than that. Cling to the Lord. Follow his purpose, his work. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this uh, passage of Scripture in the story. Lord, we... Um, Know that in your power, you're at work directing uh, the affairs, the circumstances of our lives. Think of this story of a runaway slave finding um, himself in the presence of the Apostle Paul, of all people, and hearing the truth and being transformed. And we know that you still do things like that today, Father, working in people's lives to accomplish your purpose. And Lord, I pray that the truth would take root deep in our hearts, that it would produce genuine change in us. Father, help us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds that you accomplish by your Spirit. Lord, help us to be filled with love. Lord, that we would love you, that we would love one another, that we'd love uh, people who just don't deserve it so that the gospel would shine through us. Lord, we uh, express today just our thanks for all that you're doing in our lives. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to be uh, obedient, to be humble, to be teachable, to be dependent. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God of creation There at the start for the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of light And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born
again for joining us today. Um, if you have a moment, I encourage you to go over to our website. Uh, you can uh, share any thoughts you have or prayer requests or sign up for our email list at calvaryeast.com slash respond. And then I want to let you know, um, uh, Kathy Sorensen, one of our church family, Kathy, just, I don't know if people can see you over there, Kathy, raise your hand, but Kathy's daughter-in-law works up here at Compass High School, um, teaches there, and um, she's collecting masks for the when the kids do come back to do in-person classes. So um, if you'd like to help with that, um, it could be cloth masks that you make or, you know, disposable ones that you buy. Um, but Kathy uh, would love to help collect some of those for her daughter-in-law so that they can give them out to students there. Uh, Compass High School is a continuation high school, so sometimes some kids from some rough settings without a lot of resources. So just a simple way we can serve. But um, let me pray for us as we close today. Father, thank you for this time today. Pray that you'd help us to walk with you, to have a living and dynamic faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.